I think it's uh, hardly useful to introduce Philippe, but maybe just a few words. Philippe is like uh, Schumpeter's son. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, so he is very famous for his work on endogenous growth. And when I read his book a long time ago, the first book, Endogenous Growth Theory, I was uh, very much interested by the fact that it was the first time uh, someone put into a textbook something about uh, the environment. And, uh, and uh, so it was very new. And today there is still very, very few uh, textbooks in growth in particular that put that, uh, take that into account. So thank you. So Philippe has done uh, uh, many, many, many works. Um, he is, uh, so I'm not going to elaborate on that. He is currently a professor at Collège de France and also uh, associate professor here and professor at the LSE and maybe I, I forget some <laughs> so, in SEAD, okay. And uh, he's going to talk today about uh, green growth. It's a very important topic because the point is to know whether simply green growth is possible. Is it possible to have perpetual growth in a world that is basically finite? Okay, that's the point. Uh, or are there uh, limits that are put to the growth process by physical uh, boundaries and uh, physical processes? I think this is a very, very important point. And uh, Philippe is going to tell you that innovation is going to, <laughs> to make the job, but uh, that is the point probably that we, we will have to discuss. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, it's, uh, it's also intimidating to be uh, in front of this audience and, and to be in front of my co-authors who can check on me if I'm not, uh, be if I'm not betraying uh, the message. Um, so um, so there is very, this is very much based with work with uh, David, uh, Ralph, uh, who are here in the room. <coughs> And so I, I, I call it introducing innovation in the climate debate. So, um, so what I've been doing for the past uh, 35 years now, uh, time flies, uh, 36 almost, uh, uh, is, to, uh, is to try and, and develop a, a kind of Schumpeterian model of economic growth. Uh, so start <coughs> trying to, to formalize the, the notion of creative destruction, the process whereby new innovations displace old te technologies. And with Peter Howitt uh, in 1987, we developed a growth model, uh, which is based on the following three main ideas. Long run growth is driven by a cumulative process of innovation, where each innovator builds upon previous innovators. The second idea is that innovations result from entrepreneurial activities motivated by the prospect of monopoly rents. And, uh, and the third idea is that is creative destruction. New innovations tend to displace old technologies to make old technologies become obsolete. And uh, 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 at the heart of the paradigm, there is a contradiction. On the one hand, you need innovation rents to motivate innovation activities. But on the other hand, uh, these rents can be used ex post to prevent future innovations and block new entry because yesterday's innovators don't want themselves uh, to be subject to creative destruction, so they will be tempted to use their rents to prevent subsequent innovation. And regulating capitalism is a lot about how to manage this contradiction. And whether you talk about secular stagnation, inequality, uh, green uh, growth, uh, 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 middle income trap, you always come across this contradiction. Okay, so that's a kind of theme, recurrent theme, and that's what makes this paradigm interesting is that there is really political economy at the heart of the, of the paradigm. Okay, so here I, I, I'm supposed to talk about green uh, innovation. And the way I motivate is that, of course, uh, uh, when, whenever you want to talk about green innovation, you have a uh, 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 pushback from all those who believe that, you know, growth is not what you need, uh, is the opposite of growth that you need. And they think that degrowth would be, should be the way out. And in a sense, if you look historically, uh, uh, they have ground to, to what they say. Because if you look here, I, we look at the, the left, the, these curves represent the evolution of temperature uh, worldwide. And you see that temperatures started to take off exactly when growth of per capita GDP 
started to take off. So historically, it's absolutely obvious that uh, 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 you know, uh, global warming, uh, uh, they have ground to say that global warming has to do with growth. It's when growth took off that temperature took off. And the counterfactual on the right hand side is that, you know, hadn't we had the, 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 the yeah, this pointer doesn't work, but I know it works very well. Hadn't we had the, 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 you know, the industrial revolution and all that, you see, maybe temperature would have remained constant. That's the counterfactual without the, without the industrial revolution. And uh, so, uh, and even more recently, uh, if you look at the evolution of CO2 emissions by China and India, and uh, the, the uh, orange curve and the blue, if I'm not the European, or, I don't know the, this color is not really orange, whatever, and blue, uh, you see that the, uh, the emissions by China and India take off when growth takes off. So, uh, so there is indeed, there is a link between growth and, uh, uh, and CO2 emissions. Uh, uh, now, uh, uh, should we, uh, uh, is degrowth the solution? Uh, no, we don't want to go back to pre-1820, uh, uh, you know, it growth, when I talk about growth, it's not growth of, of, of per capita GDP, it's growth of utils, it's growth of uh, standard of living, it's, it's quality growth, and we, you know, we live much longer than we used to, we, uh, uh, we live much longer in good health than we used to, uh, you know, uh, Work is much less painful than it used to be because now, you know, machines do a lot of what we, the, the painful work that was done. So yeah. uh, we don't want to go back to, uh, uh, you know, to, and also saying that you don't grow means that you don't innovate. So forcing no growth is forcing no innovation. And uh, freedom is about the freedom to invent. We don't want a society where people would tell us stop inventing, stop innovating, etc. We don't want that because I, I believe that a, a society that would impose the growth would be a totalitarian society. It would, it would just, you know, it would just prevent you from innovating. So I think the way, the way out is to innovate. And innovate means many things. It's innovate in our behavior. It's innovate in our habits. It's innovate in finding new sources of energy that are cleaner. It's innovate in finding energy saving devices to produce. So innovation is in a very broad sense. And, uh, uh, and I think that's the way out. And I think that the, the reason why we, we, we can hope uh, and what will get us out of this uh, is, is innovation. So what we've done, and um, a, a lot with work uh, uh, with David first, and uh, was with David, Leo Burstein, and Darren, uh, but before I have started to work with David with my book, I've already with Howitt, we started to think about that in the, in the 98 book, and then uh, further in, the, in, in my 2009 book, and then we, uh, we continue with David, and uh, we involved uh, Leo. Uh, with Leo, we had worked on the book, and then we involved Darren later on. Uh, um, so what we try to do is to say, well, you know, existing models of, uh, uh, of climate change and growth, when we, we started to work, were essentially Ramsey models, solo models. They were neoclassical growth models. So it would be, they were being neoclassical growth models where growth is driven by capital accumulation. And the idea there would be that uh, capital accumulation by firms generate negative environmental externalities. And you introduce uh, these ne externalities in a, in a Ramsey model. And that's essentially what uh, Nordhaus did, and that's also what Nick Stern does in his uh, Stern report. There is no innovation in those models. Okay, so so what we did uh, uh, with uh, mainly with the paper with David uh, first, and then the work with David and Ralph, who is here, uh, is to introduce endogenous uh, innovation uh, into the into the framework. Okay, and uh, w before the debate was mainly. Should you act quickly or not quickly? And the big disagreement between Nordhaus and Nick Stern is that Nordhaus would put more weight on the current generations and would be very worried that you taxed current generations too much. He would assume uh, a high discount rate, a low discount factor. That means that you put a lot of weight on current generations. Nick Stern would assume a lower discount.
discount rate. So we put more weight on the future generations and we say, therefore, you should act faster because you should be uh, worried about the future generations, whereas uh, next, uh, uh, Nordhaus would worry a lot that we don't tax too much the current generations, would uh, advocate more gradual action. And the debate was mainly on the discount rate. Quoi. And how, what is the right discount rate? So here, when you introduce endogenous directed innovation, uh, the debate becomes uh, uh, very, you know, I think much richer. Uh, uh, there are various uh, consequences of uh, introducing uh, endogenous directed innovation. For first, there is, I will talk about the past dependence in green versus dirty innovation. Then I will say, uh, I will argue that government can avoid disaster by redirecting innovation towards green technologies. Then I will argue that even with the Nordhaus discount rate, you want to act right, right away when you have uh, endogenous directed innovation. So that's something that Nick Stern liked very much because he could tell Nordhaus, even with your discount rates, we should act now. And, uh, uh, and another point that, uh, that comes out of this, uh, of this uh, framework is that you, uh, you have more than one externality. You have a knowledge and an environmental externality, and therefore you need more than one instrument. You need not only the carbon tax, but you need something else. Call it subsidies to green innovation, call it green industrial policy. And that's something that you know, came out uh, recently in the Blanchard-Tirol report, because we were uh, advising, uh, we were, was there? had the, the, the chance of being part of this commission, of the Blanchard-Criol Commission. And I remember initially, uh, Christian Goli and Mar Regant would put enormous weight on the carbon tax. And uh, I pushed very hard with Nick Cern and with Peter Diamond to say, no, you need two legs, not only one leg. Uh, carbon tax is, of course, very important, but you need as much uh, smart green industrial policy. It's as important as the carbon tax. And I think that's been a big debate. But I will get back to that. So of course, the, the main, two main papers, and now we are doing more work on that, are the paper with David, uh, 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 Darren, and Leo in the uh, American Economic Review, the 2012, and the paper with Antoine, uh, David, Ralph, and John Van Rinen in the GPE uh, 2016, okay? So let me just say, talk about the various points. Past dependence in the direction of innovation. The idea is very simple, is that, uh, in fact, we showed evidence. Uh, you, might, you might think, well, you consider a firm uh, uh, that has innovated in dirty technologies a lot in the past. You might think, you, uh, there are two ways to think. You might think, well, on the one hand, maybe uh, uh, he runs uh, uh, in dec into decreasing returns, and, uh, and maybe because of those decreasing returns, he spontaneously the firm would shift from dirty to clean innovations. But in fact, what we show is that it's not at all what happens, is that there is what we call past dependence in the direction of technical change. When you've done you continue doing what you are good at. So uh, suppose you are a good cook and a bad dancer, you innovate in cooking and not in dancing. Quoi. Uh, uh, and it's very hard to make you change. Quoi. You want to continue doing the things you are good at. And in fact, what we did, and so that's the, the paper with uh, uh, David, Ralph, uh, Antoine, et, and John, is that we used uh, uh, you know, uh, data on patents for automotive industry across 80 countries. Uh, uh, we, uh, we extracted the patents pertaining to clean and dirty technologies in the automotive industry. And, and, and for each applicant, being an individual or a firm, we know the past history of patents. So we know what they've done before. Did they innovate dirty or did they innovate clean in the past? Okay? And so here we can classify patents, you know, whether or not they, they are more uh, electric cars or, or more combustion engine. So that's a classification. You can, we, uh, it's robust to uh, changing, dirty, clean, etc. And so we have a, a, a classification into dirty, uh, hybrid, and, and uh, clean uh, technologies. And, uh, uh, and uh, once we do that, uh, uh, so, so when you are, the more top you are, the more related to electric vehicles you are, and the more to the bottom, the more related you are to combustion engines. 
and uh, uh, and so we uh, we in fact select the good patterns. So what we do is not take all the patterns because there are too many patterns. We take the triadic patterns, which are the high quality patterns. Those are the patterns registered in the US Patent Office, uh, Japanese Patent Office, European Patent Office. So they tend to be more important patterns. And what we do is that so that we say between 1978 and 2005, we uh, identify uh, at more than 18,000 patents in dirty technologies, uh, six, uh, around 6,500 patents in clean technologies, and we, we, we have uh, 3,500 uh, patent holders, uh, uh, two-thirds of which are firms and one-third of which are individuals. Okay? So that's the evolution that we have in the paper of clean and dirty patenting in automotive industry. The good news is that if we prolong, uh, if I, uh, Ralph can, can show, if I'm, I think this curve has got closer to this curve. No? The, there's been a certain catch-up uh, uh, of, uh, of dirty by clean over the more recent years, I think. Yeah, there is another reversal, exactly. So, uh, and so then what we did, and that's, I won't show many equations here, that's the only equation I will show, uh, uh, is that what we do is to regress, uh, we take a firm, I, in year T, and we look at the flow of clean patents. And uh, the flow of clean patents, we make it depend on the fuel price faced by that firm. So uh, uh, FPI, what is the flow price faced by that firm? Suppose you sell two-thirds Germa to Germany and one-third in uh, US. But then the fuel price you are facing is two-thirds the, uh, the fuel price in Germany plus one-third the fuel price in the US. So we construct uh, you, you, you know, a firm level uh, 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 measure of exposure to fuel price, okay? And that's how we do. And then we have the extent to which the researchers, uh, you know, in firm I, uh, uh, that we look at the amount, you know, they are based in certain countries, and we look at the amount of dirty and clean patenting in the countries where the researchers of firm I uh, operate. And the more important is the stock. This is the stock of clean patents of firm I, by time t, uh, and this is a stock of dirty patents, okay? And, uh, uh, and, uh, and so, so that's what I explained, how the fuel price uh, is calculated. I already said that in words. And what we find is this table. Uh, uh, so what you see first is that, so I would like to start, uh, oh, I did something, uh, uh, I want to just start here. You see first, uh, when you have the, you see a big, uh, a significant positive effect of your stock of clean on your current flow of clean. Okay, uh, uh, um, so uh, you also see that uh, uh, the stock of dirty has a positive effect on your flow of clean, but you see that it has a much bigger effect on your current flow of dirty. So if I have to subtract, not exactly what we do, but suppose you subtract. You do clean minus dirty. That's not exactly. We do one of one plus clean minus log log of one plus dirty. But suppose you subtract those. You see that the stock of dirty overall will make you innovate more dirty than clean, whereas the the stock of clean will make you innovate more clean than dirty. That's the path dependence. The more you have innovated dirty, the higher the propensity to innovate dirty today. The more you have innovated clean in the past the higher the propensity to innovate clean today, okay? So that means that if you start in an economy where uh, uh, firms uh, uh, innovated essentially in dirty technologies and you are under laissez-faire without government intervention, okay, you do kind of the policies of those who be believe that uh, all what the state should do is law and order and not do anything else but law and order, then you go into disaster because firms will continue spontaneously to innovate in dirty technologies, and that will precipitate the environmental disaster. So you need state intervention, and the good news, the good news is that uh, one fuel price is one instrument that works. You can see that here, the flow of clean uh, patents uh, depends 
uh, positively on fuel price and that the flow of dirty is negatively affected by an increase in fuel price. So the carbon tax works. I mean, the carbon tax not only it uh, induces firm to produce cleaner, but it also induces firm to innovate cleaner because, of course, when you put a higher carbon tax, you reduce the profitability of innovations leading to uh, new dirty technologies. And that's why the carbon tax is one instrument. But what we argue is that it's not the only instrument because you have two externalities. But already you can see the past dependence. The bad news, the bad news is that uh, uh, the bad news is that past dependence implies that under laissez-faire, the economy uh, may, now there is a T that I don't know if you get there, get stuck with dirty technologies. The good news is that government can avoid disaster by redirecting innovation towards clean technologies. Alors now there is one thing to, uh, I would like to make clear. Some people, like Michael Porter, believe that the uh, energy transition is costless, that it's a win-win. You can increase growth and go greener. In fact, during the period, and I will show a picture in a moment, when I force, uh, uh, for example, I have uh, Antoine who is here. Antoine, you are very good at cooking. I don't know, maybe you are a great dancer, but uh, I don't know which one you are best. Maybe you are good at both. And I force you to move away from the cooking into the dancing. Of course, but initially, your, your productivity growth will go down because I, I force you to do something you are not good at. Or maybe eventually, your dancing will catch up with your cooking. And by that time, it will be. But so there is always a period when you force firms to do things they are not good at doing. Uh, there is a period of reduced productivity growth. So you have to be aware that transition is costly. There is a cost of doing the transition. The whole, quest, the whole thing is to minimize that cost. And how can you minimize that cost? But those who tell you that you can have a costless uh, energy transition, that's, that's uh, rubbish. That's not true. It's costly. And, and uh, the question is, how can you minimize those costs? And how can you finance those costs? Okay? And I think Jean Pisani will talk this afternoon. He will, again, uh, we may disagree on a few things, but on one thing, but on most things we agree. And in particular, we agree on the fact that uh, the energy transition is a costly process. Okay? So uh, we simulated, we, uh, using the, the regression uh, that we got in that paper, we simulated what would be, have been the, the effect of, of putting a carbon tax as of 2005. Now we are, of course, well beyond. And uh, that's if no carbon tax, no fuel price increase. That's if you increase fuel price by 10%, if you increase fuel price by 20%, if you increase fuel price by 40% starting 2005, by today, we would have the, the clean technology would have caught up with the dirty technology. But of course, uh, uh, we saw already, we got the yellow vest with much less than a 40% increase in carbon price. Uh, uh, Obviously, uh, uh, but that's just to show you that, of course, the carbon price alone can do a lot, but it can be also a very costly way. And I will argue that it's not the optimal policy to only have the carbon tax. Okay, so, so the first thing is that, uh, to summarize, firms spontaneously do not do the right thing. You need, in particular, government action to redirect technical change. And one instrument to do it is the carbon price. Okay. So uh, now there are further implications. Of course, another one is creative destruction helps because I told you that firms that innovated dirty in the past continue innovating dirty. So that means that, uh, of course, if you have new firms, they didn't have the bad habits. So uh, in itself, creative destruction can help you. So I think a lot of the energy transition will be to also encourage new firms which didn't have these bad habits to enter the market and to, and to try producing green things uh, in, in green uh, technologies and green products, etc. So creative destruction itself helps you because the new firms uh, uh, do not face the past dependence problem. Okay? Uh, there is another implication is that even with the Nordhaus discount rate, you want to act right away. Why? That's, a, that's what I call the, paradox, the, par, you know, the parabola of the dentist. You know, when you have a cavity, and if you wait to go to the dentist, the cavity gets deeper and more drilling is required. Okay? It's exactly the same here. If you wait, if you wait, uh, spontaneously firms will innovate in dirty technologies. So the gap between the dirty and the clean technology will widen up. And therefore, you will need the, the period of reduced productivity growth during which 
you, uh, you force firms to, to, to concentrate on the clean technology, on the clean innovation to catch up with the, clean the dirty technology, this period will be longer, will be more prolonged. So even, and that's true even with the Nordhaus discount rate, okay? So without intervention, innovation will be spontaneously directed towards uh, dirty inputs, dirty technologies. Thus the gap between clean and dirty will widen. And therefore the cost of intervention, which is reduced growth as long as clean technologies catch up with dirty, will, will, uh, will increase. And uh, that's something that we're, I think Nick was very sympathetic to us, is that he, he could tell, he could put a petit pied de nez at Nordhaus, uh, in French, he could tell Nordhaus, even with your discount rates, you need to act now, okay? And uh, here in the paper with David, uh, Leo, and Darren, we try to estimate the cost in terms of welfare cost in terms of peer, peer period consumption uh, uh, equivalent of delaying. So that's the, the cost under the Nixter discount rate, and that's the cost under the Nordhaus discount rate. But even under the Nordhaus discount rate, you have a cost of delaying uh, uh, policy intervention. Okay, so that's I think is the first thing is that. If, if it's costly, so remember it's costly, and that's why you have to start right away, because you minimize the cost of intervention by acting now, even with the Nordhaus discount rate, okay? And that shows this, this picture is uh, very telling. The green is when you act right away. Of course, when you act right away, uh, 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 you see, uh, uh, you have the that's the growth here, the productivity growth that I represent, or the output that the level. Huh? You have the lower, that's right, you have a higher level of output if you delay, because of course firms, uh, you know, continue doing things they are good at, but you see that in the long term, uh, you do worse when you, del when you delay. You see what I mean? So uh, when you don't delay, initially there is a cost, so the level of, out of output per capita goes down, but in the longer term, you win, okay? But you can see this cost, so that's true. That's, that's the response to Michael Porter. Ma Michael Porter would believe that the green curve is always above, uh, total always above the, the, the red, and that's not true. If you, if you don't act in the short run, you have a higher uh, productivity growth and therefore higher level of per capita GDP. Quoi. That's, uh, so there is a cost of intervention, but you minimize the cost of intervention by acting right away. Okay? So now another implication is that you have two externalities because you have the environmental externality and you have the knowledge externality, in particular the past dependence. Okay? And because you have two externalities in public economics, you know that you need more than one instrument to deal with the two externalities. Hence, the two legs, carbon tax and something that you call green industrial policy, subsidies to green innovation. And that's a very important idea. And we had big discussions during the Blanchard Tyrol to say, no, there is not one leg. There is two legs. You cannot just put all your... Uh, uh, eggs into the carbon tax, okay? So here, for example, in the same paper with David, Daron, and Leo, we looked at the per, at the, uh, uh, per, year, per year consumption loss, the welfare loss expressed in, uh, in uh, uh, yearly consumption uh, of only using carbon tax. Of course, what happens with the carbon tax is if you use only the carbon tax, you need a very big carbon tax, which of course imposes a, a huge loss on current generations. It's better to make life easier. You say, if I use a combination of carbon tax and subsidies, I don't need to have such as high a carbon tax to, to uh, avoid disaster and to, uh, and to maximize welfare. Okay, so that's, uh, that I think is a big, is a big uh, point that to push because many people believe that only the carbon price would do the job and you need uh, the industrial policy. I know for many people, industrial policy is a dirty word, but uh, I'll try to m push the idea that uh, we need industrial policy. Okay, so uh, uh, another thing uh, uh, which we've, we've pushed, and that's the recent work that we did with, uh, 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 with David, uh, 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 Daron, and Lind Barrage, who, uh, who just uh, got the good news that she's the best. Uh, David, you were last year's winner of, a, how is it called, this prize? Young Environmental Economist. Yeah, voilà, under, 40. Uh, under 40 in Europe. Yeah, I would love to have a, uh, under 40. <laughs> That would be great. <laughs> yeah, me, I can only get under 70 now, it's, but that doesn't exist, unfortunately. Uh, voilà. And Lind Barrage, uh, our co-author, got the other uh, thing. And so there, the idea is to say, well, you know, you might have intermediate uh, sources of energy that are less polluting than coal, but still not the uh, ideal that you want, okay? Alors, you could see in France, you could think in France, uh, uh, nuclear energy uh, fission, par fission, is not necessarily your dream in the long term. But 
you, that's something we have. In the US, shale gas was considered. We have, by the way, shale gas in France. I know there are big debates on that. So the idea there is that should you entertain the idea of using intermediate source of energy uh, 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 in, uh, in as part of your energy transition strategy? And uh, should you subsidize production and research in that intermediate source? Okay, so here, uh, so that's based on the work with the uh, on current work with David Lin Barrage and Darren Asemoglu. And uh, so here you see you have a picture showing that the share of coal in the production of a, uh, 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 in the share of, uh, production of electricity in the U.S. has gone down, particularly at a faster rate since 2008. And that's why you had the shell gas revolution, uh, and whereas uh, the share of natural gas has gone up. Okay, now uh, uh, that's the voilà, that's the title of the paper. And uh, uh, in fact, Lind now is in Zurich. That's not to call it Gora. Uh, and so what we do in this paper is to analyze the effect of an exogenous improvement in the extraction technology for gas on aggregate pollution in short run and the long run. And uh, in words. That's what happens. It's really economics. In the short run, you have a, a, a good and a bad effect. The good effect, I have some water. You have a lot of water, man, but we don't. So, uh, uh, so the idea is that if you introduce, suppose you have the shale gas revolution, which means that in fact, you uh, suddenly you improve the technology for uh, uh, generating electricity using shale gas. You have a, an improvement in the extraction technology for shell gas, okay, suddenly. And you ask, what are the effects? And the effects, you have a, a substitution effect, because on the one hand, you will substitute co uh, uh, gas for coal in the production of electricity. That should reduce pollution, okay? But on the other hand, when you have the shell gas revolution, that in this uh, uh, improvement in the te extraction technology for gas, uh, it, it makes energy as a whole cheaper because you have a bigger supply of, of energy overall. And therefore, the price of energy goes down. And therefore, people are more willing to consume energy. And that's a scale effect. And that scale effect is bad for pollution. It increases pollution. And the question is, which of these two effects uh, dominates in the short run? So here, I'm not looking at the effect it would have on green innovation. I take green technologies as given. And we just ask, in the short run, Given for given technologies in green, etc., what would be the effect of the shale gas revolution? And you, it is the uh, result of these two counteracting effects, substitution and scale effect. In fact, if the gas is sufficiently cleaner than coal, substitution effect will dominate, so it will be a virtuous effect. And in fact, we show, we, we, calib we have a calibrated model, which in fact matches what we observe in reality. And we see that it's true that uh, thanks to the Thanks to the BSO, is the technology, is the productivity of the for extracting gas. Okay, suddenly you assume an exogenous uh, improvement in the technology for extracting gas. You see that, of course, the the emission per unit of electricity produced will go down a lot. That's what we call the emission intensity. So that's the substitution effect. But on the other hand, energy consumption go up because energy is cheaper. That's the scale effect. But you see that overall. It's the uh, emissions go down, the, the, the substitution effect, and that's the last column, a total emission go down, the, su the substitution effect more than counteracts the scale effect. And that's exactly what happened. If you look at the evolution in the US, you see that uh, uh, CO2 intensity, which was there, of course, was going down slowly, but with the shale gas revolution, went down much faster. And you see that CO2 emission that were increasing up to 2008 uh, went, started to go down. And so you can really see that, you know, indeed, in the short run, because that's just up to now, uh, 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 emissions have gone down, thanks a lot to the shale gas. Alors now, of course, the long run effects are more tricky, because the problem with intermediate source of energy is that, uh, uh, suppose now you have endogenous innovation on, uh, 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 you know, on power plants to produce shell gas versus those to produce green uh, the innovation. And uh, the problem there is that so now I look at the effect that the shell gas moon may have on the direction of innovation, whether it is to improve uh, uh, the productivity of power plants uh, uh, processing gas or, pro or the, the, uh, working on, on green technologies or on uh, coal technologies. And the problem is that the shell gas boom directs innovation away from both coal and clean. Alors, directing innovation away from coal, that's a good thing. But directing innovation away from green, that's not what you want. 
So that's the, that's the problem with the intermediate source of energy, is that it might divert research resources, innovation resources, away from clean. And uh, in the long run, that diversion might move the economy from a path which was uh, uh, involving a decline in CO2 emissions towards a path with increased CO2 emissions. And we show that in the paper, okay? So here, by the way, you can be worried because if you look at the ratio of green over total patents or green over fossil fuel patents, uh, uh, you see since 2010, uh, this flow has reverted. And we show uh, with regressions that, you know, indeed, the, the shale gas has, uh, has to do a lot with that, you see? I'm and uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so in fact, you see, now you can see here, we, uh, we have the calibration of the model, and what you can see is first the following thing. You see that with the shell gas boom, absent policy, uh, 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 without the boom, you see with the boom, you, the share of scientists in green goes down. So we see the diversion here. The, the, the shell gas boom, absent government intervention has the effect of diverting research resources, scientists, from a green innovation. As a result, even though in the short run emissions go down because of the substitution effect, can't, more than counteracting the scale effect, very quickly, you see, the uh, 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 emissions start to go up. And in fact, the overall effect is bad after, uh, uh, after just a few years. Right? You see what I mean? The, the emissions, in fact, so the long run effect are very worrisome because it's true that the shell gas in the short run gives you this decline in CO2 emission, but to the extent that it leads to diverting resources from green innovation, the effect in the longer term uh, are detrimental, are bad. Uh, uh, and the output net of damages, uh, 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 in fact, uh, uh, goes down as a result of the, of the shell gas. So, so the thing is that, the, the, the sh and you can see the welfare impact, uh, uh, and the welfare impact, here we, uh, so here we start from an old house discount rate, and then we lower the discount rate. Of course, the lower the discount rate, the bigger the, you evaluate the damage of the shell gas revolution, but that's a, the effect of a non-managed shell gas revolution. It, does that mean that we should avoid the shell gas? No, we believe we should have the revolution, or, enfin, or intermediate source of energy, but accompany that with big subsidies to green innovation. And, uh, uh, and so consider a social planner that maximizes US welfare uh, uh, and takes the emission from the rest of the world as given. As before, I mentioned we have two, two externalities, so therefore we need two instruments, the carbon tax and the clean research subsidy uh, uh, to take into account the pr that private value of innovation is too short-sighted. And what you can see is that you see the optimal policy when you have the boom, to accommodate the boom, you need to be much more forceful. Uh, uh, first, you see the uh, uh, under laissez faire, that will be the share of scientists in green. And with the optimal policy, you will substantially increase the, 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 the share of scientists in green. Because what you will do is at the same time as you do the, green, the shell gas boom, you will massively subsidize uh, 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 green innovation and, and discourage non-green innovation, okay? And uh, uh, the optimal research subsidy, you see, without the boom would be there. And you can see that the optimal green research subsidy goes up when you have the shell gas boom. Because you want to prevent the diversion away from, from gas, from, from uh, green into gas, you see? So the, the reason I had already to, for the green research subsidy goes up, is magnified by the fact that you have the shell gas boom. To make sure that the shell gas boom, you want the good effects of the shell gas boom without the bad effects. Not to have the bad effects, you need to put, you know, extra support to green, quoi. okay? And uh, uh, that's what you, alors now I would like to, so, so far I've, I've, I've talked about the role of the state, okay? I said the state, they, uh, it can, uh, 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 it can redirect the bad news firms spontaneously go do the wrong thing, but uh, the state government can redirect technical change. It can redirect technical change through uh, carbon tax, through uh, green research subsidies or industrial policy, and we saw how uh, and the state can also be very helpful to manage uh, uh, an intermediate source of energy like the shale gas revolution. Okay, and in each case, the laissez faire would not do it. Quoi. You need state intervention. But what I would like to argue here is that you. Also need civil society. Uh, above, uh, 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 is there a role for civil society? And we believe that there is a role for civil society. So that's very much based on, on work with Roland Benabou, Ralph Martin, and, and Alexandra Roulet. And Ralph is here. And uh, this is a paper that just came out in the American Economic Review Insights. 
and uh, uh, and there the the, the view is uh, uh, the, and I just show one table, but I just tell you the story. The story is as follows: first, uh, uh, consumers can put pressure. That means that if you are in a place where consumers value the environment. F even if firms are not virtuous, they follow their consumers because they want to make profits. So they will, if they know that consumers will look, for example, at the CO2, uh, uh, you know, content of inputs and outputs of the firm, uh, they will, uh, and, and you know that consumers take that into account. That's a big inducement, uh, uh, a big incentive to uh, produce and innovate clean. Quoi over on top of what the state can do. Quoi. And that's what you see in the first column. So here we did exactly the same similar. We took automotive industry, but we went, of course, much further than 2005 because it's a uh, last year paper. So we go as far as uh, 2018, no, 2017. Uh, Ralph, how far do we go? 2012, voilà. But still, we had seven years. Okay, exactly. And so what you see is that the first uh, row is the values. Values, alors, what is the values? Is that with the values, world value survey, we know the extent to which in various countries consumers worry about the environment. You are a firm I. How do we calculate the firm level exposure to values? If I sell two thirds of my production to the US and one third to the, uh, Germany, but the, my value at the firm level value exposure is two thirds the values in the US plus one third the value uh, 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 number in, in Germany. So that you construct a firm level a value number, okay? And so firms that are more exposed, you can see that, so here, the, the left-hand side variable is log of one plus clean minus one, log of one plus dirty. It's your propensity to innovate clean rather than dirty. And what you can see is that when the more you are exposed to countries that have high values, the more you innovate green. That's very important in civil society, okay? But what's very interesting is the third row. You show that this effect of value is enhanced by competition. And the reasoning is as follows. I will again uh, take Antoine as my victim. Antoine, you are virtuous, and I am not virtuous. We knew that, okay? Bon. And, in fact, uh, 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 first thing, you are not in the market. I am uh, only producer. I know that my consumers value environment, but on the other hand, I hate doing clean stuff, so I could still do okay by not doing much clean innovation. And suddenly, you come in, and you are virtuous, I am not virtuous, but I know then that if I don't move towards clean technologies, I lose my customers to you. You get my customers. I, I, and therefore, I will, even though I am not virtuous, I will, facing competition with Antoine, who is virtuous, I will innovate green to escape competition with, uh, with Antoine. And so competition forces firms that are not deep the virtuous themselves to, uh, uh, to align more with the values, you see? So that's very interesting because you see that there are other instruments on top of carbon tax is that if you are va anything that can influence values and, 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 and plus combined with competition policy, uh, that is also a big driver of green innovation, okay? So that's what we show in this, uh, in this paper. You can still see the effect of carbon price. Of course, carbon price is also something that increases the propensity to innovate clean. So conclusion, I arrived to a conclusion. First conclusion, innovation-based climate models suggest that action must be taken urgently and that multiple instruments should be used. It, act, it suggests that one, the max acts now, and okay, and not just the carbon tax. It suggests also that there is a role for firms, the state, and civil society. So that's the triangle, okay? Le marché, the firms, they innovate. But you need the state to redirect technical change with the carbon price, with industrial policy, with maybe how to manage intermediate source of energy, etc., with competition policy. All that is done by the state. But then you need civil society. You need civil society. It's the consumers. It's those, you know, who push firms to innovate. It's also, by the way, as we know, civil society is important to enforce competition. We know that very often, uh, when you don't have civil society, uh, uh, you have collusion between incumbent firms and the state, and it's very hard to enforce competition policy. So see, the triangle, and this idea of the triangle is very much put forward by Wendy Carlin and Sam Bowles, and so I always give them credit. We are very good friends, very close friends, and I think uh, uh, this triangle is absolutely key to the success. Okay, so that's the first conclusion. Another one is that 
uh, <coughs> when I talk about industrial policy, we were a bit vague about whether they should be targeted or non-targeted. You could tell me, well, you know, just saying that you subsidize green innovation, is that truly an, in uh, an industrial policy? And uh, in current work with David and Ernest Liu, who is at Princeton, we, uh, we, 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 have, we develop a model where targeted industrial policy is very important. Uh, we consider the green and uh, energy transition along the value chain. So we have a, a chain where you have a final good and an input to that good and an input to the input and an input to the input to the input, like a Fari Bakae, a production chain, okay? And, uh, uh, and there are complementarities across sectors because if nobody else electrifies, for example, you will not electrify. And uh, uh, because you have these complementarities across sectors uh, at the various layers of the production chain, you have multiple equilibria, one where everybody adopts, one where nobody adopts. And uh, in fact, uh, there is a role there for, industrial, for targeted industrial policy to coordinate the clean transition. And uh, uh, if you use only a Pigovian tax, uh, to remove, to, to just select the equilibrium where everybody does it, you need a huge carbon tax, and that would be, of course, well, in welfare terms, uh, uh, extremely heavy, particularly on current generations. So that's a model where typically targeted, you, you, car you need the carbon tax, but just the carbon tax alone would be extremely costly to make sure that all the sectors coordinate on, on, on electrifying, on, on moving to clean. Okay, so that's something we are pursuing. I would like to say something uh, to finish on the role of finance. Some, uh, that's current thinking with uh, Antonin Bergeau, Martin De Rieder, and John Van Rinan. And uh, there is a notion of green finance. Uh, uh, I, 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 I am sympathetic to the notion of green finance. I think that I believe in the role of finance. Which I told you before that creative destruction can help. Anything that can encourage good uh, new firms, young firms, is already green. Quoi. So I think finance uh, 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 that a low access uh, to credit and, and investment of small firms is green already. You see, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't dismiss the notion of green finance, but finance is, is and so what we do here, I, 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 we will do more, uh, we look, for example, at the effect of the exposure to German banking crisis uh, 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 on green innovation. So we look at German firms, and uh, they are more or less, in particular, commerce bank had to cut lending after losses to uh, uh, international, international trading portfolio. And we look at the uh, firms, how much we know uh, the, how firms were exposed to the commerce bank, you see, more or less. Quoi. And, uh, and that's a measure of credit crunch quoi, on the firms. You see, that's the, the heterogeneity that some firms were very exposed to commerce bank and, and others were less uh, 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 exposed to commerce bank. And you see what's very interesting is that the, the commerce bank shock overall patenting and we rank patents into green and, and dirty patents, but not only automotive industry, we do that for all sectors, okay? We go beyond automotive. And first you see that on overall patenting, not much of an effect, but on green patenting, it had a negative effect. You see, that's interesting. So just the credit crunch in itself uh, uh, had a, a, a negative effect on green patenting. And what's very interesting is that it's not so much driven by, uh, 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 it's, it's driven by, by small firms uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and young firms. You see, here, here I think there is a mistake. It's a large firm. It should be large here. There is a typo. It's driven by small firms and it's driven by young, young firms. So it's really the crunch reduced patenting, green patenting, because it reduced green patenting primarily by young and small firms. You see what I mean? And therefore, finance in itself, uh, uh, making finance more easier access to finance, tends to uh, encourage green, particularly because it encourages green in you, and uh, that's very much with the idea of creative destruction. You see what I mean? So that's, uh, we are just at the beginning of that, but it's interesting that uh, uh, finance, to the extent that it's, uh, it helps uh, the development of young firms, which are the small firms and the young firms, usually small and young go together, because you start small and then you grow, or you don't, but uh, 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 that's how uh, finance is a driver of, of green. And that's another instrument. Anything you can do to help develop finance and access of small firms can be something about. I would like to, uh, uh, oh, I would like to add, I, uh, alors there, there is, uh, yeah, alors I had a, a, a last slide, alors I, I, I'm not showing the, the latest version, there is a big debate in France now on how to finance the transition. Uh, we know that it will be very costly to finance the, the energy transition. 
And the work, the re report by Pisani, uh, Ferry, and Selma Mahfouz is a very important report because it's the first serious attempt at, uh, 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 you participated, I think, I don't, uh, uh, and, and to have a kind of macroeconomic uh, assessment of the cost of, of energy transition. So I think the, the, the work is a phenomenal work and is the first attempt to look really at the macroeconomic cost of transition. Uh, well, in, 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 they do it for France, okay? Now then, uh, I think the report, I think, is, uh, is really a very important piece of work. Now there is a debate on how to finance it. And there we have a small, uh, I, I don't see things exactly the same way. Uh, I believe that the transition to green uh, the, uh, is, is a very much, you know, of the same scale, at least, that one of the building the railroads in France. Quoi. When we had to build the railroad system, I think it's a huge deal. Quoi. And for this, I think we need public-private partnership. And, uh, uh, and I think it's very important. So I think that some, some, some kind of instruments we could mobilize is first, I think, EU borrowing. So far, EU as a whole has borrowed very little. There was some borrowing during COVID, post-COVID, for the recovery plan. I think we have to extend that borrowing, and the EU as such should borrow. But it could borrow against the, the revenues from ETS or from carbon tax. So I think the idea would be to have EU borrowing linked to the revenues for ETS, okay? So that would mean that already you mobilize some amount, uh, which is EU countries, okay? And then what you do is to involve the private sector through development banking. For example, I worked for two years at the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, but the World Bank is the same. For every euro that the EBRD puts on the table, you, you can invest three euros because then the private sector contributes two euros, you see what I mean? And so the idea would be to say, you have this EU borrowing which is based on the ETS and uh, carbon tax, and based on that, you mobilize private sector through development, through smart development banking, and then you can mobilize the, the kind of amount that Jean Pisani and Selma Marfouz are talking about. We are in that scale. Quoi. And I think that that's a, a private, a public private partnership. I also believe very much in a green European DARPA. You know, DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. It was created in the US in the 1950s to, uh, because the US were racing with the Soviet Union on space and defense. And it was the idea that, you know, basic research is done, but you, can, you have an S-curve problem. You cannot mo quickly move from basic research to applications because you have to coordinate resources and actors. And there what you have is you do smart industrial policy. So the DARPA money comes from the defense ministry uh, in the US, and they, they, they choose team leaders, and the team leaders elicit competing projects to say, on a mission, and the mission is put a man in space in two years, or achieve this weapon in two years. But they did that more recently with BARDA. BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, we had to produce vaccine in one year. So we, the RNA messenger technology was there. You had to turn it in one year into mass production of vaccines. That's how we are here today. We will not be here today. We are. So, and that, that is exactly like the DARPA. And, uh, and what's very smart with this is that it's, uh, it, it is top down because the money, you have money coming from the ministry, but it is also bottom up because the, 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 the team leaders elicit competing projects. You had uh, Moderna, Johnson, Pfizer, uh, many others. And so you have, it's a pro-competition industrial policy, and it's an industrial policy that mixes up top down and bottom up. So that's a smart way of doing industrial policy. I think we should do the same with energy. We should create a European DARPA, a, 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 Europe, a green DARPA, that would also, and that's also a way to combine public and private funding. You see, that's another instrument for public-private partnership, and uh, 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 that should be, and I think we, we can, uh, because there are a number of technologies, you know, hydrogen, uh, nuclear fusion that we are pursuing, uh, there are other things. There is also Plan B. Alors, I know uh, we never talk about Plan B, but uh, we, we start talking about Plan B. You know, there are researchers that try to look at devices to cool down the air. So there is a mirror system that there is something that uh, Per Crucel and John Asler speak, talk in a paper uh, that's uh, coming in a volume so soon. There is also the Harvard physicists who work on a technology that we, to uh, inject sulfur in the air. And uh, uh, that's also a way to cool the air. Alors, it's not yet, uh, but you know, they are making progress. 
there are those plan B with the plan A uh, the devices, and I think it's important to push those things, and Europe should take a lead, and a European a green DARPA would be also an instrument to achieve that. You know, there's been a long debate, you know, the view in Europe, we have a Hayekian Europe, we are a, a, a regulatory giant and a budgetary dwarf, and there was very much the idea that any form of sectoral state aid would be anti-competition. I think it's not right. You can allow for sectoral state aid. Instead of having an a priori legalistic approach, you can have an ex post uh, uh, empirical approach. I allow for state aid. Make sure it's pro-competition. If it's not pro-competition, we intervene. But you should not preclude. We had a competition policy in Europe that was anti-industrial uh, policy. We have to, to have a competition policy which accommodates smartly designed industrial policy, in particular in, in, uh, uh, for green innovation. So the problem is that in Europe, you see, the tools that we have are not appropriate. We had the Maastricht Treaty where any kind of spending was put on the same footing. We cannot put green uh, investment innovation on the same footing as recurrent sources of deficits. So that has to, in the way to implement Maastricht Treaty, we have to change. Second, we had a competition policy which was anti any form of sectoral state aid. We have to move away from that. And third, we had a, a, a mini budget. We have to allow for EU borrowing. And uh, if we change our practice, and you know the uh, US are, is doing it with IRA, they are very forceful on ind green industrial policy, China is doing it, and if Europe uh, keeps not doing it, we will be completely not in the race. So I think we, we, we need this kind, we need to, re to really stop thinking that uh, industrial policy is a bad word, and we have to give ourselves the possibility to do industrial policy like the Chinese people, like China does, and like the US does, because we are also competing with them. And I think that's, uh, that's uh, uh, <coughs> that's an important thing to uh, that's an important thing to I think I, I am there uh, I think that's essentially what I wanted to uh, what I wanted to say thank you very much well, there is another an, a last thing I wanted to talk about the last idea I knew uh, you know there is the problem of transferring green technology to less developed countries and uh, there, uh, Michael Kramer, who was Nobel Prize winner with Esther and Abhijit in uh, 2019, uh, he, he wrote about malaria, a very smart paper in 96, because he said the problem we have is the following. We had that problem with the vaccines. You want, you, you want to reward innovators. Okay, so you need patent system or at least a reward system for innovation. But at the same time, you want to be able to transfer the technologies to less developed countries. How, how can you... How can you reconcile the production of innovation and the diffusion of innovation. And one way that Michael Kramer had in mind was that you, the states would purchase the innovation, at a, there would be kind of auction on the innovation, and he would purchase it at a price equal to the price plus a social markup that he could evaluate for vaccines, okay? Maybe you can do one for green. And then you diffuse, Alors, he, he was thinking of the US state, but we could think of a community of countries, and you could think of a joint sovereign wealth funds, or multi-country, multi that would purchase you know, green innovations to, uh, from innovators in, uh, the, and, and, and diffuse them to, uh, to less developed countries. So I think that also is something, I know there was a summit last week on uh, you know, finance, uh, international finance. I think this uh, Michael Kramer idea, I think, should be uh, uh, also implemented in the idea of, in the area of, uh, of uh, you know, energy transition. Right. Sorry, I'm done. Okay, thanks, uh, Philippe, for this presentation and all that you said. Maybe just one point, at the, at the end of the presentation, you have this... Uh, uh, introduction of the fact that we have to finance, to finance the, the, the transition. So maybe you could say more about uh, the tool, uh, because you said, that, okay, you need uh, these uh, uh, subsidies, uh, uh, this uh, type of policy, so it's costly, especially for uh, uh, the, 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 the public uh, budget. So what do you propose? Maybe you may be sure to, to use. Ways, but you know, the, the thing to bear in mind is that to future generations, you have the monetary debt and the environmental debt. So if nothing is done now, uh, uh, you, you leave a bigger environmental debt. You see, so you, now you cannot think of the debt the same way as before, <laughs> because you have the, the monetary debt and the environmental debt. And you also try to say, I will, I will still have growth, because I will do a policy 
that will still resume growth. So the growth will finance you uh, uh, partly, and uh, uh, and that's why you and uh, and and you have to be aware that you know the uh, not doing anything will will increase the debt because it will force future generations to themselves invest much more. And I think that's uh, that's why you need to. But you know, when we did the railways, uh, there was a lot of debt. You know, we we. But it was an investment for the future. It's an investment. So what you call debt, I call it investment. And you invest in uh, in future sustainable growth. That's what you do. Yeah, the public debt wasn't at the same level this time. I don't see without this public-private partnership how you can get to the scale that's required. I just want to, to follow yes. up on that. For yeah. me, the, I, I agree with what you said, but for me, the question is who is going to decide what is the good debt and what is the bad debt? Because you could do the same reasoning for, uh, uh, for schooling or for hospitals. It's a good debt, investment for future generations. So who is going to say, OK, this one is a good debt and uh, this one is bad? This. I think the way, well, it's, that's not exactly the way you do. Yeah. I, I think what you do is to try to do is what I call the draggy doctrine. I, I wrote on that. I mean, uh, no, Draghi is no longer, he was prime minister at the time. Now he's not. Maybe I brought him bad luck. <laughs> but uh, uh, you, you, what Draghi did was to say, well, you know, I try to continue reforming the state. I try to reduce the, re the re you know, recurrent sources of deficits. And at the same time, I gain credibility to invest in other things. So I, I, think, I think we have to push that view that there are, you can't put investment in the same footing as uh, you know, other sorts of spending. And, and I think that's an idea to push forward. But you could also push forward the idea that in the same way that with the COVID, you know, we saw there were some kind of emergencies, green is also an emergency. So you might prioritize the, the, the things for which you would allow, for example, for EU borrowing. You may decide to, to give priority to certain things because you consider that this is survival of humankind quoi, and that has priority. But in general, I am in favor of not treating in the same way. If I believe, in fact, when Draghi negotiated with the EU, because he was showing that he was making effort to reform the state and all that, he, gained, he, got, the, he, he got green light to also be able to improve his education system, etc. I, mean, I think that's, that thinking has to evolve in, uh, in Brussels. Uh, but if I had to borrow, to say the EU borrowing, I would put priority for the EU borrowing on the green, because I think it's a kind of survival of humankind which is, in, uh, which is at stake. And there you see that the US move on that and uh, is moving on that front as well. So it's a, it, there is a really the issue of respond to IRA. How do we respond? One response is to be protectionist, but I don't believe that's the, that the right way. I think the best way is ourselves being very assertive and have industrial policy. Et yeah, so I wanted to follow up on this, uh, that uh, in, the, in, uh, in the case of developing countries, so when it, uh, when it comes to developed countries like EU, okay, the, I, I believe if everybody agrees and you show the uh, returns on investment of uh, the green transition, like they can increase the debt levels, etc., etc., but like developing countries right now, the, their situation, fiscal situation yeah. is very poor and their debt levels are very poor and do you think like, how these coalitions that you mentioned before could work with developing countries and the diffusion of innovation when the fiscal situation of these countries is very poor. Well, th then, of, of course, I'm not a specialist. You had Esther coming earlier, and I saw uh, one day I had an insomnia, and she was uh, being interviewed by, uh, uh, by Bourlange uh, of the uh, par French Parliament, and, and I think she, she gave very good answers. So I think we, need the, the co we have to rethink international finance, to uh, to ensure better, you know, developing countries against risks like COVID, uh, so that they could do a bit uh, whatever it takes the policies that we did, uh, and uh, and the other thing we need to do is this kind of devices of def of being able to us the developed country act as a sovereign wealth fund to to transfer technologies to those countries. But that we we have to do that for uh, and, and 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 find devices for that. You know, Al Gore has been very forefront also on this idea of sovereign wealth funds, and nobody really took. A, you know, to cap these ideas on that. And uh, that's, uh, I would push in that direction. Because you see, otherwise they will tell you, why do you deny us to pollute when you polluted to get developed? Quoi? And of course we could say, well, but now we are at the very highest level and now we are all facing disaster. That's one argument, of course. We were not at the time, but that's, a, that's not enough of an argument. It's better to say, well, you know, we will give you the technologies and therefore you can move. But if we don't give the technologies, how can we, you know, punish them from uh, you know uh, just growing and doing what we did, they they want you know they want to imp improve their standards of living, and so uh, we can't prevent them from doing that. 
And so we, we need something like this, like this uh, transfer of technology device. Otherwise, India might uh, unilaterally implement plan B with uh, sulfur. You know, one day India could do it. India could do it unilaterally. Huh? And that, that affects everybody. Hi, sorry. Thank you for your talk. What do you think? I don't know who you are. Oh, Where? I'm right here. Hi. Ah. Hi. Uh, I have a technology specific question. What do you think the role of CCUS is with regarding um, lock in and path dependencies on dirty technologies? Where the US is? No, CCUS, carbon capture and storage. What do you, do you think it's just going to continue the problem of lock-in and path dependencies, or do you see it having a role, a real potential uh, yeah, for mitigation? I don't, yeah, I, I'm not, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not on top of this, so I don't, I can't give you, uh, I, I would not give you a proper answer. I, th I think there is progress made in that, uh, in carbon capture. There are people who are very optimistic, I think it's one thing to explore. But I don't think it will be the solution to the problem. It's what I think there are various, you know, the solution will be like various things combined. It's one thing to explore and to improve, but it cannot be the only solution. Uh, you, you need to find new sources of energy, uh, much cleaner, and to pursue the other things as well. But uh, it's, it's one thing to be pursued. Maybe I don't know if David or Ralph wants to add to this. Uh, to this uh, I see that as one option, as one uh, in, a port in, a wide, in a broader portfolio. And you don't see it as just a continuation of the path dependency problem? The, 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 the carbon capture as part of the path dependence? Did you say, David? <laughs> sure. I, I, I mean, I guess it depends a bit what type of carbon capture. If it's carbon capture in a, in a coal power plant, and it's not perfect carbon capture, then yes, it is the same thing as, you know, shale gas, it's kind of an, uh, an imperfect, it's an intermediate, an imperfect intermediate that then can reinforce path dependence. If it's director capture, uh, which is not attached to a power plant, then it's a, it's a complementary technology that allows uh, to capture CO2 for sectors that are really, really hard uh, to decarbonate, because we want, you know, when we talk about net zero, that means that we need to have some negative uh, technology, and in that case, the director capture will be one of these uh, negative technologies. Uh, hello, I have a small question. Uh, yeah. Do you think that uh, uniform carbon tax in the EU can be a good solution uh, to reduce like uh, certain types of dumping uh, across the European countries? So, uh, uniform that means depend not depending on the level of development of the country, uh, uniform across countries. So, we say, do we treat the same way? Uh, more developed EU countries and less developed EU countries? Uh, is that what you have yeah, in mind? Yeah, exactly. The pr ideally, you want things to be, uh, to, you know, to take into account heterogeneity. And uh, the question is, uh, you want also things to be implementable. Quoi. And, uh, and so, yeah, there is what we call in France, les usines à gaz. Quoi. So you always have the trade-off between, you want something, you know, ideally, you would like something very targeted, very, you know, but on the other hand, you want something feasible and not subject to, you know, I would argue that I'm less developed. You, so th that's always the difficulty. Uh, uh, and but we know also from the Yellow Vest movement that uh, you have to take into account and uh, very good report you did for the Conseil d'Analyse Economique and all the work you did, that you need to take account the fact that situations are, you know, vary from, uh, you know, uh, that you have the people who live in uh, downtown, the people who live in suburbs, the people who have no alternatives, and, uh, and so you have, you, you, you need to find the right, you know, the right uh, compromise between accommodating, you know, the fact that some countries are still catching up and some others are not, and the fact that you want a system which is, you know, not kind of Kafkaian, and, and that's always the deep. By the way, the Yellow Vest movement is very interesting because it shows that just increasing the carbon price can be very bad. It can be bad when you don't have the alternative technologies. What was very unfair with the with the, the carbon price raise that that led to the was the fact that the suburb people in suburbs didn't have. The, there is very bad suburban transportation in France, and so when you, you had no alternative but using a gas oil car, uh, 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 you know it was very unfair to impose an increase in carbon price on them. And uh, that's why you need the carbon. You want to combine carbon price with alternative access to alternative technologies. We you can see there, it's a very also illustrative uh, example of the two-leg approach. You cannot just have the leg of the carbon price. Yes. 
But just regarding interest rates rising right now, we're likely to start to see a credit crunch. Yeah. Uh, do you think that the industries are prepared and governments are giving enough support to counter the problems that we saw in 2009 with the decrease in pa patents and therefore innovation? Alors, I think you raise a very important question, uh, is that we, to, c to uh, curb inflation, we, you know, usually the monetary, we resort to monetary policy and increase in interest rate. And the problem is that if you increase interest rate too much, uh, you delay uh, uh, investments, in particular green investments. And you see, that's a very interesting discussion we had in Washington a, a month ago, is that, you know, usually you want, uh, you know, the idea is that you want to reduce inflation because you want price stability. But we know that uh, pollution uh, generates price instability. So uh, now you see monetary authorities face the following di dilemma. If they increase interest rate too much, they will delay green investments, which will prolong pollution and therefore generate future price instability. So you have to rethink how you deal with inflation when you are, uh, when you have to, to, to operate to, to implement an energy transition. Because you know that energy transition is key to long-term price stability in particular. So that, so that means that to quell inflation, you, don't, you not only need interest rate rise, but you need industrial policy as well. You need to increase supply. We, we realized that we had bottlenecks, that the, the current uh, inflation is generated by the fact that we are too dependent on energy from certain countries, and also we had bottlenecks, and we have to deal with them. But the way to deal with them is increase supply. And if you do, if you d and if you increase interest rate too much, you discourage the increase in supply. So now you have to combine uh, 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 monetary policy with smart industrial policy and supply side policy to, to, to reconcile the need to, of course, uh, control inflation with the need to not delay, uh, uh, to, to, to deal with inflation itself already, and also to reconcile that with the, with the necessary uh, energy transition. You see, so you have to rethink the way of implementing uh, 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 macroeconomic policy. I was talking about the debt. You cannot just look at the monetary debt, ignoring the, if, for example, to reduce my debt, I delay green investments, that's very stupid policy because I leave a higher burden to future generations. I cannot think of m monetary debt independently from the environmental debt. When I think about increasing interest rate, well, I have to listen a bit more to Joe Stiglitz and say, well, oh, okay, be, uh, but be careful quoi, when you do it because you may, you may shoot yourself in the feet. Quoi. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Philippe, when, you, when you talked about the uh, civil society, you focused on the consumers. Uh, making choices of the consumption product. Yeah. What about households as investors? Is there something interesting happening there as well? What do you think is the relative importance no, of that? I know you're right. I mean, so there's been work, not by me. I know Oliver Hart and uh, uh, Luigi Zingales have looked at shareholders. So I think that's a very interesting uh, uh, also literature that I, I, I recommend you to look at. And uh, of, course, of course, and there is a civil society at large, the media, the, the, the unions, uh, I, I believe very much in civil society. You know, in France, we have a big problem is that, you know, we have to explain our uh, political leaders that, uh, you know, there is something called civil society and that uh, they have a big role to play, actually. And I think, uh, so it's much beyond consumers. A question again on the, on the carbon tax. The EU is considering a border tax adjustment on, on carbon. And I'm wondering if you're worried a bit about the return to protectionism, given how hard it is to implement yeah. this kind of Yeah, I, uh, there is always a worry that the, uh, the, the carbon tariff, la, la, la tax carbon aux frontières, is a pretext for protectionism. And so you, it's an, uh, you should not completely... There is one issue, you see, that one justification for you not completely disregarding this instrument. You keep track of the time. Five minutes. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, is that, you know, some countries, when you, when you have globalization, some countries may turn into pollution heavens. They may decide, okay, Europe is now becoming virtuous, suppose, or whatever, US a bit more with Biden than with Trump, okay? And therefore, all polluters come and produce uh, uh, in our country, and then we re-export, because now there is free trade, and they can, you know, abuse free trade. They can abuse WTO, you see, to become pollution heavens. So the carbon tariff is one way to deal with that problem. But the problem, exactly as you said, the problem with the carbon tariff is that you start here and you end up here, is that it can be a pretext for protectionism. So it has to be done very carefully, maybe restricting that to certain kind of inputs, 
uh, concrete, I don't know what kind of input, but uh, Kathleen, you know, may know much better than I do. And uh, so it's, a, it's more like a threat, you see, I mean, but my, my view is that with, uh, with countries, you should say, look, we will make the green technologies available to you. And at the same time, if you turn into pollution heaven and the technologies are available to you, then we have the threat of the carbon tariff. But of course, the, we want the threat not to be used. Quoi. And if it is to be used, it should be used uh, uh, in a very careful and regulated way, because ex otherwise, exactly as you say, it's a, in fact, it's a pretext for pro straight protectionism. And, and, and the, 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 li the, the line is, is quite fine. So you have to, to strongly regulate the use uh, of the carbon uh, tariff. In Europe, the good thing is that they do not give rebates on exports. Yeah. It's just the import side, so That's it's right. a bit less... A bit less protection. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are there other questions? On the yeah, just if I may. Yes. Uh, we wrote a paper with Fanny uh, a long time ago about the, uh, to come back to innovation, about the fact that when you do innovation for green uh, electric cars, for instance, or uh, changing the way you produce energy, you do not increase productivity, labor productivity. No. It's just for climate, okay? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, if, if it can be very, it can be bad for growth in this sense. That's it part can, of the. That's that part of the of the. You saw the slowdown of growth in the short, at least in the short run. Maybe you do other things better later on because you learn to do better. Yeah, but, but certainly in the short and medium term, there is a loss. Yeah, yeah. but the loss maybe maybe the loss maybe. maybe loss. That's why you need yeah. to finance the transition. Yeah. I I'm yeah. completely on board with this uh, yeah. argument that there is a cost of transition. I don't, I'm not on the Michael Porter line. I'm on the pisani ferry uh, Marfouz mm. line on that, totally, and on your line. And that's why we need, uh, 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 we need to mobilize funding of the scale that corresponds to, the, to those needs, which are huge. And that's why I was thinking of the EU borrowing augmented by, uh, you know, uh, well, you development banking, and I was thinking of, you know, uh, really uh, allowing much more firmly for industrial policy. I think that, we, that is what will, uh, where you again evolve with the DARPA public and private funding, because I believe that that is what will br bring you the, the funding that you need to finance the transition. Otherwise, I don't see any other thing that's been proposed which will give you anything of the scale that you need to finance the transition. If you find something else, please give it to me, because I haven't, I haven't seen it. Last point, because you talked about the design report, is the, the proposal you made to, to tax, to, to make this uh, transitory tax on rich people. What do you think about that? I, uh, my view on this, broadly, alors my view first is that it's a fantastic report on the cost of the transition. I think the financing of the transition deserves another report. I think it's a big enough question that, uh, well, well, uh, we should put all the ideas on the table and, and, uh, and have another report. I think it's big enough a, a, a question to deserve a report on, on its own. That's my, that's my view on this. I think I'm not dismissing anything. You see what I mean? I have, uh, he, they have this idea. I have my own ideas. Other people have, uh, have expressed other ideas. I think it's time now to, to really uh, go for a report that would be on that question of the financing, you see, very broadly. And I also think that I don't see a French solution to the problem. I see a European, at least European solution to the problem. It has to be done at European level. So whatever we do, it should be done at European level. We are small. I mean, we, we, on est très franco-centré, nous. On est, uh, we are no longer the center of the world. I mean, uh, so I think we have to, re to do this at least on European. If you want to compete with IRA or with the China, it's Europe that has to do it, including the UK, by the way. I think we should involve in, a, in, a, in the DARPAs that we create, we should involve the UK. And, and I, I don't see a French solution to this. And I have to go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks so much.